Good morning, Heritage Church. Uh, good morning to those of you in the room. Good morning to those of you who are on live stream. So glad to be here with you. My name is Jason, and I do hope to see you all uh, at 430 over in Sereno Park. It's going to be a good time. It'll be about an hour long. Um, we try to time it so uh, that we're going to be there when the sun goes down and to be all schmoopy uh, for all of us. Uh, and then I would love to see that angel tree cleared off. That'd be great. Uh, there is an option online for you to go online and, and contribute that way as well um, if you're not here in person. Um, I, I resonate with the things that Jessica was sharing uh, just with respect to thinking about Christmas. Uh, but I'm, in a, I'm in kind of in a weird headspace with it a little bit. I love Christmas. You guys know that by now if you know me. I love Christmas. Uh, and on one hand, yeah, like, you know, we're, we're decorating weeks earlier than we normally do. On the other hand, I've also been finding myself, it's a little hard to kind of get into that headspace of, of Christmas festivities and celebrations as well to some extent, and I don't know if you've experienced that or not. Um, and I, I want to use this time of Advent, this next four weeks are going to be, uh, they're going to feel a little bit different than normal. We've added some things, there are going to be some things we don't, that we normally do in the service that we're not going to be doing, like communion, for instance. We're going to be doing some different uh, sort of sacramental things over, over the next couple weeks for Advent. Um, but, but my hope with Advent and celebrating this is that we, we get ourselves, allow ourselves to get into um, just being honest with ourselves, uh, with one another, with the Lord, so that we can really, truly, honestly celebrate Christmas. Uh, that is the wonderful thing about uh, traditions and rhythms and seasons, uh, holidays, where they come. Inevitably, they come and they land um, wherever we are, right, in life. So this year's been an interesting year, but Christmas is coming. And so we... Uh, we, uh, together as the people of God, are, um, we need to, need to gather ourselves and figure out how are we going to really treat and celebrate Christmas this year. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, we're actually going to stay in Matthew, but it's perfect. Um, we're going to continue on in Matthew chapter 14, but over the course of Matthew 14, we're going to look at, um, the ways that, that, um, we deal with uh, some difficult things like loss, uh, like brokenness, um, like fear. And in the midst of that, ask, where do we find joy and peace and hope and love in, in times like this, in, in times when things are hard and difficult? Um, we're going to talk about the fact that the Christ in the Christmas story, we see that God is with us. Um, in Matthew chapter 1, Jesus is described as Emmanuel. Remember that? If we can like rewind our minds all the way back to the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. Man, or Jesus is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so we're going to see that even in the midst of these, especially in the midst of these hard things, God is with us. So let me pray. Let's acknowledge here together today that God is with us here and now. And then we're going to jump into Matthew 14. Heavenly Father, um, we do together just acknowledge that you are with us. That you are here in our midst. Regardless of what's going on around us. Regardless of how distracted we've been and perhaps not even taken a whole lot of time to just pause and reflect on you and your presence, God. You are still with us. Your presence is not dependent upon our awareness of your presence. And we thank you for that. I pray, God, that you would meet us in your spirit right where we are. Um, and I pray, God, that uh, you, would, you would guide us in your word here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the narrative continues in Matthew 14, and so I want to read this. I'm going to explain what's going on here, because that's important for us just contextually, and then we're going to turn to see what God has for us today um, from this passage. So 14, chapter 1, uh, we're actually going to take it into the beginning of verse 13. 
It says, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they, had, they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. It's not your typical Christmas story. And yet, part of the Christmas story story that we even heard read here this morning is the birth of John the Baptist and how critical, how important he was as this prophet in the spirit of the Old Testament prophets where Elijah was like the quintessential prophet. John comes along and is, is, is so tied to the coming of the Messiah to Jesus. And we read about his marvelous birth and now we see in Matthew 14 his death I want to explain, like I said, what's going on here. Um, First of all, I want to pay attention to what Matthew's doing. I think Matthew's doing something really important here. Much of this is sort of parenthetical to what Matthew does at the very beginning of this text here in verses 1 and 2. Remember, Matthew's been holding up for us different ideas, different people's ideas of who Jesus might be. And the point that he is, the, the, the purpose of that is to lead his readers, that's us, to a decision about who Jesus is. Jesus has been called all kinds of things up until this point, like the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Son of David. He's been called um, an accomplice to Satan. The Pharisees accused him of being in league with Beelzebul, the, is Satan, in casting out demons. Uh, when he went to Nazareth, uh, Matthew held up this idea that maybe Jesus is just a guy. He's, he's, he's our homeboy. He's the guy that we grew up with, whatever. Uh, and now Matthew is holding up another possibility going, well, let's, let's see what Herod has to say. Oh, he is John the Baptist come back to haunt us so to speak. He is John the Baptist reincarnated. I don't know what kind of theology Herod had there, uh, but presumably there were some people, the people that he was speaking to were like, oh yeah, maybe. So once again, Matthew's holding up for us this, who is Jesus? We have to make a decision. We have all these conflicting responses. And of course, Matthew is continuing to lead us. And we're going to see that more and more and more to the truth that Jesus is none of these He's not John the Baptist reincarnated. He's not in league with Satan. He's not just some guy. He truly is the Son of God. He truly is the Messiah, the long-awaited, the long-expected Messiah that the Jewish people were hoping for. And he has come, although he's come in ways that no one expected. And that's what we're remembering through Advent. Christ's coming, the Son of God, come to earth in the form of a man. And in that, we look ahead to his second coming. So that's what Matthew's doing here. But, but let's just kind of, I, I want you to understand the story so that we're, not, we're just distracted by looming questions in the back of our minds as we turn the corner to go, all right, what, God, what, do, you, what do you have for us in this? So this Herod might, might make you remember Herod from Matthew chapter 2, right? Uh, not the same Herod. The Herod in Matthew chapter 2 is actually this Herod's dad. That was Herod the Great. That was the the Herod that rebuilt the temple. Also, the Herod that had all those babies killed in Bethlehem, trying to eradicate and exterminate the Messiah. Horrible, horrible guy. That guy had died. 
but um, before his death, he divvied out his kingdom. So he was considered a king, but he divvied out this kingdom, and one of the recipients of this divvying up of part of the kingdom was this Herod in Matthew chapter 14, Herod Antipas. Um, Herod is not called a king because he's not. He's called the Tetrarch, which actually means the ruler of a quarter of a kingdom. So he's just basically just this local ruler guy who is a kind of a puppet for Rome at this point. But he has influence and he has power and um, obviously enough to throw a guy like John the Baptist in prison. And he had unjustly divorced his wife and taken his brother, his half-brother Philip, who also received part of Herod the Great's kingdom. Um, Herod took Philip's wife, divorced his wife, took Herodias, which is weird that they're kind of named the same thing, right? Talk about narcissism. I'm not sure how that worked out, but that's, that's what we have here. Is, um, he took her, his brother's wife, for, his, for himself. And John the Baptist, in the form of prophet, uh, spoke out against that and spoke uh, against both Herod and Herodias. And neither of them liked that. But Herod in particular was very nervous about doing anything to harm John the Baptist because many of the people loved John the Baptist. They believed he was a prophet. And so while Herod had him thrown in prison because he, didn't, he, he couldn't be talked to like that, um, he was afraid to put him to death because that would have been a bad political move. So then his birthday party comes around and things get weird because now Herodias' daughter, Salome, she dances for Herod and everybody there. And he's so enamored with her that he makes this rash oath to say, I'll give you whatever you want for the way that you have entertained us here today. And quickly Herodias, remember Herod's wife, uh, pulls her, her daughter aside quickly and says, ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. And she goes and says, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And Herod uh, now sees the, the trap that he had walked into, is embarrassed by that, and doesn't want to go back on his word because of the oath that he made and the people present there. But he sort of regrets that he uh, got tricked in that way. Plus, he kind of does wants to but doesn't want to put John the Baptist to death. But he does so anyway uh, to save face. And so John the Baptist is beheaded. Um, and, brought, and his head is brought in on a platter. John's disciples, his followers, they come and take his body and bury it and then go and tell Jesus. There's this horrible web of sin that leads to the beheading of John the Baptist. This man that had been um, so key, so instrumental in God's plan for the Messiah, for his kingdom to come. His life is ended with, a blow, with the blow of a sword. And it's done. And all this sin, it seems like it just taken over here. The world suffered a terrible loss that day. And it seems like the kingdom of heaven suffered a terrible loss that day. And we read here, and it seems by his reaction that Jesus himself suffered a searing loss by losing who was his cousin, actually, John the Baptist, this man who had, had, had paved the way for him through his preaching, who had called for repentance because the kingdom of God is coming, who baptized Jesus, this man who was instrumental. Jesus knows what it's like to feel the emptiness of loss. You can go to other parts in the story of, of the biblical narrative to see how true that is. We know that Jesus wept at the grave of his, of his friend who had died, Lazarus. He probably wept over the fact that his friend had died. He was also probably weeping over the, over the grief and the sense of loss that people around him were feeling and experiencing that day. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He wept over the fact that his own people, God's chosen people, could not see, would not repent 
and to turn. They had missed it. And Jesus grieved that loss. Jesus lost his friends as they, fors- they, they, they left him and they betrayed him and they denied him. Jesus lost his life alone, dying on a cross. And in that moment, even lost a a communion with God the Father as he took on the sins of the world. When you look at the gospel, even up until this point in Matthew, it seems like Jesus is a magnet for people who are suffering, who are lost, and who are broken. And in that, it's really, really good to remember that Jesus is not distant in our losses. I don't know what kind of year you've had, uh, what kind of couple of years you've had, what kind of life that you've had. The reality of life, unfortunately, right now, though, is loss. We've all lost something. What have you lost this year? Have you considered, have you allowed yourself some space just to think about those things? I've lost things. Some of them seem kind of trivial. Maybe not. I was supposed to have a sabbatical this summer. I'd actually met with somebody with a, with a coach. There's a coach for that sort of a thing. And I was going to, I was going to take a, a, some weeks off. And of course that didn't happen. I don't tell you that to, for your pity. I tell you that to relate because you've, you've lost things too. Maybe you lost um, a vacation. Maybe you lost um, a graduation. Some of you have lost a wedding. You've lost what school used to be. Some of you are mourning that loss for your own kids. You've lost jobs. You've lost income. You've lost a sense of security and what we would call normalcy or routine. We've lost togetherness. We've lost harmony and agreement. We've lost health. We're living in broken relationships. We've even lost a loved one. Either because they've passed away or moved away or simply moved on. There was a professor at Phoenix Seminary couple of years ago, I heard him talk. He's actually no longer with us. He was talking about ghosts. Not ghosts in like a Halloween kind of scary sense, but ghosts in this reality that we all have. We have ghosts in our lives. And you, you get more and more of them as you get older. And these are ghosts of people who have passed away or moved away or moved on, and these are people who've been in our lives 
perhaps even significantly, and they're no longer here. And we see them at the dinner table or around the Christmas tree. We see them in the different places that we go to. We see them here. I'm seeing a lot of ghosts in the last couple, three to six months. people who used to hang out out here in the lobby and they're not there anymore. People who used to serve in kids who used to worship alongside of you. We have these ghosts in our lives, this sense of loss that what do we do with that? And there may be some of you who can't relate. Maybe you're even a little taken and overwhelmed by my emotion up here because for whatever reason, 2020 for you has been a good year. You haven't had a whole lot of loss. So there's the door. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. To you, I, would, I just would ask for your, your empathy then, your compassion, to realize and to recognize that there's a lot of loss. There's a lot of ghosts. What do we do with these? Do we suck it up? Do we just pretend like, no, that's just, I'm just going to, press on, give ourselves a pep talk in the mirror to say it's not so bad. We do, right? We tend to compare ourselves. Well, my loss isn't as bad as their loss. But let's remember, any loss is not from our Heavenly Father. Every good and perfect gift is from our Heavenly Father. Loss is a part of this fallen, broken world, the sin that's in us and around us, and it grieves the heart of God. What do we do in this type of loss? Jesus heard about the death of his friend, John the Baptist, and he withdrew He didn't suck it up. He didn't preach himself a sermon in the mirror going, come on, man, you're the son of God. You got this. He withdrew to a desolate place. He gave himself space to grieve. There's a difference between healthy withdrawal and unhealthy withdrawal. An unhealthy withdrawal is just checking out. It's, it's numbing the mind. It's, it's, it's filling our, our minds with something else just to distract us, whether it's entertainment or substance or p other people even. But then there's a healthy withdrawal where it's not to escape. It's not to numb the mind. It's not to check out. It's to engage. It's to engage with our Heavenly Father in the midst of loss. And I think that's the message for us today is to consider a healthy withdrawal. And when Jesus withdrew, he went to a desolate place. If you look back in the Old Testament, a desolate place is always described as a place of uh, scarcity. It's a place of no distraction. It's void of life. It's a place of need, uh, desolation, this desolate place. It is a wasteland. Fortunately for us in this instance, we live in Phoenix. We could drive 30 minutes and get to a desolate place 
where there's just nothing. And Jesus goes to a desolate place. The Old Testament speaks of it as a place to be avoided. Don't, you don't want the desolate place, so follow God, enjoy his blessings, obey him and his commandments, because otherwise there's desolation. It's a pain, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a place that's synonymous with pain, sadness, and defeat. But Jesus, in the New Testament, anytime a desolate place is mentioned, it's Jesus going and finding that place. Finding that place of pain. Finding that place to withdraw, to be with God. And what does he do in that place? Well, Luke 5, 16 tells us outright. It says that Jesus would withdraw to desolate places to pray. To lose all distractions. To get away and be with his heavenly father in prayer. God is not unaware of your loss. Whether it's a fresh loss or, or an old loss, God is aware of your loss. He is not aloof. And in times of loss, our hearts feel rather like a desolate place. A place of pain, a place of sorrow, a place of defeat. But what we see, even in the word Emmanuel, is that God, your Father, is with you there. Just as Jesus would go out and seek the desolate places, he is with you there in the midst of your loss, in the midst of your desolate place. I want us to take some time, a few minutes, right now just to kind of simulate I guess a desolate place to just pause to stop and let the spirit of God guide us even as painful as it might feel to take inventory of our losses and in the midst of that consciously agree with the reality that God is with you. That Jesus is Emmanuel. If you're on live stream right now, I just want to ask you, just really, really beg you um, in the midst of the distraction or the comfort of your own home, just take this time to just pause, just to be people in the room are a little more of a captive audience and so I just want to ask you just give a special ask to you to participate in this for the next couple minutes um, AJ's playing here just to kind of drown out some of the ambient noise as we're just going to take some time of silence to consider our loss but also consider that God is with us in the loss
God is with us. destitute in these desolate places, God, of our hearts and minds. And although those ghosts, so to speak, are a reality for us, Lord, we know that they don't last. So I pray that you would turn our sadness into singing. That you would, Lord, that you would meet us in our lament and in our mourning over loss. Lord, not to dismiss them, not to explain them away, not to put them in a box somewhere and try to place them on a shelf. Lord, to really, truly meet us in the midst of your love and your kindness and your grace. Lord, there are some losses that that will be felt until we meet you. And I pray for those who are participating in worship here today who have those kinds of losses losses that feel very permanent right now. Lord, I ask for your comfort. I even dare, Lord, to ask for your joy and hope in the midst of those losses. Not that we forget, but that we truly remember. Remember those people, but also, Lord, remember you your presence here with us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. How do we celebrate then in the midst of loss? Christmas is coming. How do we do this? In the narrative of Matthew, the loss of John actually draws our attention more to Jesus. It's unfortunate, but in a way, if you look at it in a sort of a, a cold way, John needed to go so that Jesus would take front and center in the reader's mind as we see this. Our attention is drawn to Jesus. He's not a ghost. He's the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world, and he is coming again. And Jesus himself said earlier in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let me talk about comfort just real quick here. There's all sorts of ways that we're comforted. Sometimes comfort feels like a warm blanket. Sometimes comfort feels like stuffing and mashed potatoes. Sometimes comfort feels like the presence of a loved one. Sometimes comfort uh, is perspective and clarity. And I think that's what we get here. I think that's one of the things that we're called to in the midst of loss is that, that it, it is, to, is to find God in that desolate, or that actually God finds us in that desolate place. And then the Spirit of God gives us some clarity, some hope. In Hebrews, we're told to fix our eyes on Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18, Paul writes, For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. God meets us with the comfort of clarity with that eternal perspective in mind. And what we find in Jesus is not condemnation or belittling 
or dismissal in the losses, we find what has been true all along, and that is that God is with us. I want to encourage you to take time in your coming days as you celebrate Advent and, and, and look forward to Christmas. I want to encourage you to withdraw. Withdraw. Your desolate place, place might be a room uh, that is quiet. Maybe it's out on a hike. Maybe it's your backyard. Maybe it's your office. And some of you are like, I don't, I don't got time to, there is no desolate place. My, my whole house is a desolate place, you know, because you got kids running around and it's just mayhem everywhere. Maybe you need to with, uh, find a desolate time to withdraw. It's never easy or fun to go into a desolate place. Like our, our hearts don't naturally long to go there. It's hard. It takes sacrifice. And so maybe for some of us, it's a desolate time. It's a half hour early in the morning to get up when there's no distractions and just be with God and to enjoy the presence of God. And I want to invite you to participate in something that I've been, I'm, I'm starting to do starting today is when I can, uh, maybe in those times of withdrawing, just to be with God, to pray, light a candle. It's a perfect time of year to do that because Christmas is coming. But let that candle be a visual representation of the presence of God there with you. Lastly, what I'd like to do is demonstrate something for us, but also to enter into it together in what is called a Lectio Divina. It's just simply, that's just Latin for uh, a, a devotional reading. And what I'd like to do is um, lead us through this, through a very short uh, section of a psalm, Psalm 34, 18. I'm going to read it through three times. We're going to start out with just a little bit of silence. I'm going to read it through three times. And then we're going to respond and, and finish out our worship service with one last song. But would you just participate with me if you're online or here in the room today in a way that we can just pause and reflect. Just take a moment here to ask God to quiet your heart and your mind. Just listen, close your eyes, listen as I read. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Again, this time I'm going to ask you to just listen for a word that really grabs your attention because we're going to take that word to the Lord in just a moment. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And saves the crushed in spirit. that word. I'm going to read it one more time, and at the end of me reading that, I want to ask you just to take that word to the Lord and go, God, what do you have for me in this moment and with this word? The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. to God about that in your heart.
you give us a deeper just awareness of your nearness? God, we ask you to save us each day. I pray, Lord, that you would do something new in us. For many of us, this has been a painful season of life. And yet, Lord, you are well acquainted with pain. You are in the midst there with us. So we ask, Lord, that you would that you would save us and that you would do so to your glory. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Israel.
glad to be here with you all. I'm glad to celebrate Advent and Christmas with you, my church family. I'm looking forward to this afternoon. Hopefully uh, many of you will be there and hopefully to see even some faces that I haven't seen in person in a while. That'd be so great. Um, just really missed so many of you who are still participating online and um, hope to see you soon, maybe tonight. Um, on your way out, we do have boxes at the back if you'd like to give. We have options to give online as well. Um, I also wanted to make you aware, uh, there's a, uh, an organization here in ta town called the Spiritual Formation Society of Arizona. And on December 13th at 5.30, they're doing what they call a Blue Christmas. Uh, and it is a, it's a Christmas worship service for those who uh, just don't necessarily feel like they're in that space to be happy and joyful just yet uh, because there's been some painful things um, that have kept you from that. So if you have more questions about that, you can see Jessica Meeks. She'll give you the information about that. Um, also want to invite you to join with me um, in getting this book. It's actually by Ted Wiesty, who, uh, is, who leads the Spiritual Formation Society. Uh, it's called Let Every Heart Prepare Him Room. It's a 25-day Advent devotional. Uh, pretty straightforward. There's, a, there's a, a short devotional for each day of December leading up to Christmas. And so I highly encourage you to go on to uh, go online and buy this and uh, we can kind of do it together. So that'd be great. Light your candle and uh, do a, a, a short devotional that has to do with Christmas and Advent. Uh, would you all stand? Even if you're at home, go ahead and stand. Even in the midst of loss, we have the wonderful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And sometimes that message is even more powerful when we're experiencing these kinds of things because of the hope that we have in Christ. So would you put up your hand just as a way to say, yep, I want to be a part of this and just receive this commissioning, this blessing as you go out, that you would go in confidence that God is with you, that he sees you, that he knows you, that he loves you, and may the hope that you have in Christ lift your eyes to greater clarity as you trust and follow him to his glory. Amen.